Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh and a very good day. So today I would like to share a theory on the subject of SPC. So SPC stands for Statistical Process Control. So definitely in our day to day, we'll be observing uh, a lot of uh, variation in our process. Okay? So from, for example, in this case, um, this is a time series plot. So over the time, we can see the up and down in a, for a selected parameter. So if you want to determine whether this variation that we are seeing right now can be considered a common cause or expected or special cause effect, unexpected, so we need to use SPC. So this is the main reason why people use SPC to monitor the stability of a process variable. Okay, if the variation is expected, so we can say that the process is in control and if the variation is uh, not expected, so we can conclude that the process is out of control. On top of monitoring the stability of a process variable, I also have experience using SPC to set a KPI target, okay, uh, set limit for the uh, process, okay, this limit which is the UCL and LCL, I will show it later, that we can incorporate into our SOP and also I have experience using SPC for a visual comparison. For example, I would like to compare side by side between uh, before improvement and after improvement data set. I so can use SPC for that. Okay. So inshallah in my next video, I I hope I can share how this four can be uh, executed by using Unit 19. So the second point in this slide is more on the selection of control chart. So the selection of the control chart depends on the type of data that you are dealing with. For example, if you have a variable data, then you need to first determine whether you have a subgroup or you do not have any subgroup. If let's say there is no subgroup, you need to select IMR chart. IMR chart stands for individual moving range. And if you have a subgroup, then you need to determine the subgroup size. If it is more than nine, so you need to use X bar S. X bar S stands for standard deviation. Whereas the if the subgroup size is less than nine, then you need to go for S bar R, R stand for range, uh, range. So for the discrete or attribute data, okay, you need to know whether you are counting the defective or you are counting the defect. If you are counting the defective, so this is basically will be uh, some sort of binomial distribution, okay, then you have P or MP chart. So in the case where, for example, uh, you inspect 100 credit application a day and it is either corrected and you pass it through or it is incorrect and you need to send for reward. So in this case, you need to use MP chart because your sampling size is fixed 100 for every day. But let's say if you are tasked to inspect 2% of the credit application a day and the same thing you check it you are you checking on the go no go or corrected or incorrect so in that case since you are having 2% of the sampling every day definitely you not be getting the same sample size so in this case you need to use the p chart but if you are Counting the defect. So this is more on the poison distribution. Eh? You're counting the defect. For example, okay, uh, let's say I inspect uh, 200 orders a day from total 5,000 order a day and I evaluate the order form by counting uh, how many fields are incorrect or how many fields are left blank. So every form that I inspect has the same 20 fields to be filled in. So that is when I need to use the C chart. But in case of U chart, for example, uh, I inspect 200 order from the total of 5,000. Still, I am evaluating the order form by counting how many fields are incorrect or how many fields are blank. But the only difference is for U chart, when every single form has a different number of fields, to be filled in. So this is reflecting towards uh, not having a constant sample size. So in this case, I will be using the U chart. Okay. And the point number three is basically uh, some of the uh, definition, which I think is important, related with this uh, control chart selection. So when we talk about variable data, 
variable data is basically a number that uh, we get through measurement system. When you want to get the diameter of specific uh, tube, for example, you need to have a measurement uh, jig for us to get the diameter. So that is what we call a numeric variable data. Whereas discrete data can be in two forms. The first is numeric data. So this is what we call discrete numeric data. So the number that you get through counting. Okay, uh, for example, uh, you are counting the number of uh, defective parts or you are counting the number of defect in a report. You are counting the number of uh, new COVID-19 cases. So that is more on the uh, discrete numeric data. So another discrete data will be in the form of alphabet where you have binary or binomial. Yes, no, good, no good. And then ordinal, okay, this one is something that we usually experience when we fill in a survey where we have agree, strongly agree, disagree, strongly disagree, and nominal reflect to any form of alphabet. So these are the discrete data. Rational subgroup, okay, rational subgroup over here. So rational subgroup means that when a group, uh, a group of units produced under the same set of condition, same machine, same procedure, same material, for example, and then uh, you also need to know the difference between the subgroup size and the number of subgroup. Okay, the subgroup size is basically uh, referring to the number of data that you collect for each of your subgroup. Okay, for example, you have three rational subgroup, shift A, shift B, and shift C, okay, working on the same material, on the same mission, on the same procedure. All right. For example, shift A, you collected 10 data. So the subgroup size for rational subgroup shift A is considered 10. All right? Whereas the number of subgroup is just simply the number of subgroup that you have in your data collection uh, strategy. So when you want to select between X bar R or X bar S, it actually depending on the subgroup size, but not depending on the number of subgroup. So in slide number two, the first point here, I would like to share the components uh, in SPC. So basically in SPC, uh, we have uh, what we call a special cost region or unexpected variation region. So this is in red. So basically this region is beyond or uh, above your UCL, upper control limit, and below your LCL, lower control limit. And the next region is this yellow uh, zone. So this is what we call a common cost region or expected variation region, which is basically in between uh, the UCL and also the LCL. And of course, you have the data that you have collected. And from this data, SPC will calculate the center line. This is the average from the data they have collected. And also, SPC will calculate the UCL, upper control limit, and the LCL, lower control limit. So the upper control limit and the lower control limit is basically three standard deviation away from the center line. So this is the uh, basic component in SPC. How can we use SPC to monitor the stability of our process? Okay, I did mention this in the first slide. So in SPC, uh, most of the statistical software, including Minitab, uh, they are using Nelson test. Okay, a Nelson test, altogether we have eight Nelson tests. Okay. The first Nelson test, which is any point outside the control limit, so this test is a very critical test. It's a must test. So this test is to check whether uh, is there any data that you have collected falls in the special cost region. All right. So if your data fail this first Nelson test, we can easily conclude that the process is out of control and some things need to be done. Whereas the rest of the Nelson test, from Nelson test number two up until Nelson test number eight, this is what I call as a proactive monitoring. Okay, this seven test is basically to uh, to study or to evaluate the runs, the trend, the pattern within the common cost region. So if let's say one of these tests fail, it you it actually trigger a signal that something is happening and you have to fix the process before it's too late. So when I say before it's too late, this too late is referring towards 
when the process uh, produce a data which is fall in the special cost region. Okay, so the analogy that I usually use to uh, understand this Nelson test is just like, for example, I'm sending my kids to school. All right, so definitely during the school hours, my kid need to be within the school compound. Okay, in the class or in the canteen. All right, so if my kid is not within the school compound during the school hours, so it's just the same as violation for Nelson test number one. All right, okay. Let's say if I have no problem with that, okay, my kids always will be in the school compound during the school hours, but as a parent, definitely, I will proactively, I need to monitor the academic performance of my kid. I need to ensure that he's not uh, mingling with a bad influence student and other things that I need to monitor. So all those things that I'm monitoring is basically we can I can say that the same as the Nelson test two to Nelson test number eight, which is a proactive monitoring. So this is uh, important concept, and with this Nelson test, uh, we are able to determine whether our process is in control or out of control. So in this third slide, okay, uh, I would like to illustrate the Nelson test in a graphical form. So Nelson test number one, which is the most critical test, uh, is basically any point outside the control limits. Okay, plus minus three is the deviation from the center line. So this is a very critical test. So if we have this uh, fail on Nelson test number one, so we need to say it is out of control, totally out of control. Okay, Nelson test number two, number three, and number four. This is mainly used to uh, evaluate the trend. Okay, the trend in terms of the shift to detect the shift of mean or the shift of uh, the standard deviation, but in a different algorithm. For example, Nelson test number two is nine consecutive points on the same side of center line. It can be whether in this region or below the center line region. Nelson test number three is when you have six consecutive points increasing or decreasing. In this case, this is an example of increasing. It can also detect six consecutive points in the decreasing mode. And Nelson test number four, when you have two out of three, one, two out of these three in, uh, in same zone A or beyond. So this is the Nelson test number two, three, and four that is meant to detect a shift in mean or in shift and standard deviation, but in the different uh, algorithm or different uh, method. So Nelson test number five is the same as Nelson test number two, number three, and also number four to detect a shift in process mean, uh, but using a different method. The method is basically four out of five, four out of these five point in same zone B, or it can be in same zone A, Okay, in this region or the upper region. Okay, whereas Nelson test number six, seven, and eight is basically to address the issue of uh, non-standardization in the process. Okay, but using the different uh, method. So, for example, Nelson test number six, when you have fourteen consecutive points alternating up and down. So, this is showing there are two alternately used parameter. Okay, or you have. Uh, uh, two different quality from vendor. So this is addressing the standardization issue. Now some test number seven, when you have 15 consecutive points in, in the zone C above or below the center line. Okay. So this is also the same thing, which reflecting towards the uh, standardization issue. And last but not least is now some test number eight, where the method is uh, detecting eight points in a row outside zone C either side. So that is all the eight Nelson tests that we can use to monitor the stability of our process variable. Of course, the most important thing is Nelson test number one, and the rest is more on the proactive monitoring. Okay, that's all for this video. Thank you.